Hey, everybody, this is Ben Bowman. Welcome back to another episode of The Oregon Bridge. I'm astonished that Pre is as big as he is now, as it's been almost 50 years. In his book, mentions about how he was almost abashed at approaching Pre. You know, this guy was a force. I mean, the first time I ever saw Pre run in, in Hayward Field, was 1971 AAU championships. I think that he needed that pressure to sort of come up to the standard that he felt was appropriate. You know, if I keep training like this, I'm gonna be real hard to beat. All right, folks, uh, on today's episode, I was very excited to talk to Tom Jordan. Uh, Tom Jordan is a retired former director of the Prefontaine Classic for decades. He's also the author of the book Pre, uh, which is about Steve Prefontaine. And as you can imagine, this week's episode is about Steve Prefontaine, who is an Oregon icon, an Oregon original, um, perhaps one of the most well-known people to ever come out of Oregon. Very famous athlete, attended the University of Oregon, shattered all kinds of records, um, and then dies an untimely death uh, way too young um after competing in the 1972 olympics so why are we talking about steve prefontaine on the oregon bridge podcast uh well i will say first of all the best part about being a podcast host is you get to have conversations about whatever you want with whoever you want um so the opportunity to talk to tom about pre was something that i was really excited to do uh as i show in the uh, episode this is the sports illustrated cover with steve prefontaine as an 18 year old kid uh, on the cover. He just uh, signed with the University of Oregon. But this episode is also about like Oregon's culture and Oregon's uh, how the sports and athletics is part of the Oregon story. We talk about a little bit about Phil Knight in this episode. We talk about Bill Bowerman. We talk about Nike. We talk about the University of Oregon. We talk about Coos Bay. Um, I think it's another part of understanding who Oregon as a state is or what Oregon as a state is today is understanding some of the imp major people, cultural figures, icons, um, businesses that uh, led us to this moment. So in this episode, we talk about who Pre was, why he was notable, what made him an interesting and unique person. Uh, he really was an international celebrity. Um, and he was from the, the town of Coos Bay and then went to the University of Oregon and competed at the highest levels of athletic competition. Um, we talk about, uh, we read at the end, I read a quote from Tom McCall that Tom McCall says at, uh, or, or writes to Pre's parents after he's killed. We talk about the, his death. There's some controversy. There's a bit of conspiracy about how he died, um, what actually happened, how much we know, how much we don't know. There's lots of urban legends about Pre. Um, so it's really a fascinating story and something that I'm personally really interested in. Um, so I hope listeners that you enjoy uh, the conversation with Tom Jordan and 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 think about Pre's legacy. I mean, I as I say in the in the podcast, I just bought a T-shirt from the Woodburn Outlet Mall that says "Stop Pre" on it. Um, and as Tom remarked, I think after the podcast, most people who bought that shirt uh, probably aren't really familiar with the story of why it exists. Um, and yet, Pre's legacy and status as an icon remains. Um, Pre's rock in Eugene. Uh, is still consistently left with with trinkets and flowers. The Prefontaine Classic, as Tom says, is going to be bigger than it ever has been before. There's still a statue of Pre um, at the Prefontaine building at the Nike head World Headquarters in Beaverton. Um, he's still a part of our culture, still part of um, who we are as a state. And so I wanted all uh, the Oregon Bridge listeners to have a glimpse into who he was and why he mattered. Um, so with that, I will uh, stop the introduction and we will jump right into our interview with Tom Jordan about the legendary Steve Prefontaine. Oregon law imposes several ethical obligations on state and local public officials. State law also regulates and requires reporting by lobbyists. Harang Long PC's lawyers work with public officials and lobbyists who need advice on how to comply with government ethics rules. We also represent clients before the Oregon Government Ethics Commission when they are accused of violating those rules. Our deep experience with government ethics helps us evaluate issues efficiently 
and offer practical advice in what can often be contentious and politically charged circumstances. To learn more about Harang Long's government ethics practice, go to harang.com. That's H-A-R-R-A-N-G dot com. All right, Tom Jordan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Appreciate being here. So, Tom, before we jump into a conversation um, about Steve Prefontaine, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Um, you have done a couple things, at least in your life, that are particularly relevant to Pre, but how did you kind of get on uh, the professional journey to become um, the director of the Prefontaine Classic? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, after I graduated from college, I wanted to continue running and uh, trying to elevate my level of, of uh, talent, which didn't really happen. <laughs> I needed a part-time job and I got it at Track and Field News, which was located just down the road. And that led to getting a staff writer job there and then eventually moving over to the business side and becoming the associate publisher. And in 1982, I decided to relocate to Eugene and I got here and worked for a year as a freelance writer which is a very difficult, sure. very hard way to make a living. Yeah. And um, the previous meet director of the pre-classic got a full-time job at the University of Oregon. So that position came open and the Oregon Track Club asked me if I would like to uh, be the meet director. And I had never actually been a meet director for a track meet. I've been to hundreds. I've run in dozens but I had never actually organized one. So it was a challenge. That was 1984. Okay. Through a decided lack of imagination, I kept doing that for 37 years. <laughs> and at what point, for our audio listeners, I'm holding up a copy of the book, Pre. At what point did you write this? Well, I wrote the first edition in 1977. Okay, and so right I, after he died. Yeah, I, hopefully you can see that. Yeah. That was published by Track and Field News. And in 1995, roughly 20 years later, Rodale Press asked if I would do a second edition with some updates and uh, some uh, additional interviews. So I did that. And that's the one that's in the bookstores and available on Amazon. So uh, there are actually two editions of the book. So, so last question about you for now before we focus all on pre, and this is about pre too. Uh, you, you you noted a lack of imagination, but I imagine there's a bit more to it than that. The Prefontaine Classic is essentially supposed to be, I think it's it's called a living legacy of Steve Prefontaine. What and you obviously wrote a book about the man. What about Pre was so interesting to you? Like what drew you to him that made you want to commit, you know, a major part of your life to to this man? Um, yeah. yeah, it wasn't actually a. Um you know, a, a conscious decision. But I was working as a staff writer at Track and Field News at the time of his death in 1975. And I figured that Kenny Moore, who's a very famous writer, uh, would do the definitive biography of Pre. But I felt like I was in a, a singular position to do the story of his career, because not only did I have all the statistics but I had all of track and field news's photos of pre and plus I was a fan. I, uh, uh, I'm only a year and a half older than he was. So I felt kind of, I think maybe a kinship. Hmm. And so I wrote the book over the period of a year and, uh, track and field news published it. And it was, uh, well, one or the other edition has been in print ever since. Wow. So, okay, let's let's talk about Steve Prefontaine, the man, and let's start appropriately in Coos Bay, Oregon. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Steve's personality and what kind of person he was, but how do you think about the role that Coos Bay played on shaping the person that Steve was? Oh, I, I think it was instrumental. Um, if you've been to Coos Bay, it is the quintessential working man's, working person's city. Mm -hmm. It is uh, no way a um, kind of a, uh, 
not to get into political terms, but sure. it, it's a case where people there are real down to earth. They don't have much use for anything that isn't um, isn't real. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also think that it's a very harsh environment in the sense of requiring people to show that they have the talent to succeed. And so I think that, you know, Steve went out for football and he was too small and certainly too short for basketball. And what he found he could do was run mm -hmm. and not only run, but simply by a force of will outperform everybody else. And as, as it happened, he turned out to have a tremendous natural ability to go along with this kind of uh, willful personality. I love that. You quoted Kenny Moore. Uh, I'm going to read his quote about Coos Bay on page five of your book. Uh, this is a direct quote. To understand Steve Prefontaine, it is necessary to know something about Coos Bay, Oregon. The town and the man find themselves similarly described. Blunt, energetic, tough, aggressive. Coos Bay is a mill town, a fishing town, a deep water port. Longshoremen, fishermen, and loggers are not given to quiet introspection. Coos Bay endures its difficult elemental life in the woods, on the boats, and docks with a vociferous pride. The working men insist on a hardness in their society. Youth must be initiated, must measure up. Uh, and I thought that kind of paints a picture of how you can imagine. I mean, some of the books you use in your book, uh, or some of the words you use in the book to describe pre intensity, work ethic, grit, guts punishment, pain, competitive, you can kind of get a sense of how the place might have forged that kind of a mindset in an athlete like Pre. Yeah. So, so in terms of what he was like as a person, um, obviously he becomes something greater than himself. I've got my, in my collection, I've got the, the uh, sports illustrated cover. He becomes basically a, a celebrity. Um, he becomes more than just a talented track star, how do you understand how Steve Prefontaine became this sort of iconic, internationally known guy when he was just sort of a, a quirky athlete from Coos Bay just years before? Oh, that's a really complicated question because, uh, you know, part of it was his talent. Uh, he was enough of a charismatic personality that, Sports Illustrated, when they used to put Olympic sports athletes on their cover, which they haven't done in 40 years, um, you know, they picked him out as this is the next prodigy. This is the guy who's going to uh, rewrite the record books as far as American track and field go. And in fact, he ended up doing that. So I think that there was that natural talent. There was the charisma, the personality. And I think also um, it ended up being a confluence of factors that really, it, it's almost incomprehensible when you think about it, but when Bree was at Oregon, mm -hmm. Bill Byerman was developing his waffle shoe. Mm -hmm. Phil Knight, who was a former Oregon athlete, was transitioning Blue Ribbon Sports into Nike. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Bree was number one on their list of athletes that they wanted to sign. The problem being, of course, that it was illegal right. for athletes to sign anything that would end up getting them money. So uh, <laughs> they uh, managed to work around that a little bit and hire Pre at, um, for a non- running job he's like and director of marketing or director of public relations or public something like that. and i think it was global director of public <laughs> I mean, he never thought small and i think that that goes in with it i mean phil knight if you if you've read shoe dog you know he, he more or less says that the company was modeled after the the kind of uh brashness and and uh success that that pre had so when you have that and then of course after his death 
what you had was um, Nike, you know, making free sort of their touchstone. Mm -hmm. I think that's the word they use, their, their touchstone. So the first building on the new campus that was constructed is Prefontaine Hall. And that has all sorts of memorabilia in it. Plus, my book came out in 1978. And for a number of years, um, I would get I would get letters from athletes and coaches. And sometimes the athlete would say, I've only read two books in my life, and one of them's yours. Wow. And yeah, it, it was it was impactful. Then, of course, Jeff Hollister, who was a, a uh, icon at uh, at Nike did a documentary called Fire on the Track, which I, in my mind, is still the best sort of summary of what Cree was like and what his influence was. That came out, I think, in 1995. And then there were dueling movies. There was Prefontaine, that was sort of a Jeff Hollister um work and then there was without limits which was kenny moore and uh so you know all of a sudden you had uh something that the next generation of athletes could watch and now you know it used to be they'd say well i read your book the night before every big race now it's i watch without limits or i watch prefontaine hmm. the night before a big race so in essence it ended up being a case where not only did you have my generation, which was Pre's generation, uh, being fans, but then those folks became coaches, they became teachers, et cetera. And the next generation became Pre fans. And then the next generation. I mean, I'm astonished that Pre is as big as he is now, just oh. simply because it's been almost 50 years. I was at the Nike outlet store in Woodburn um, a few weeks ago, and I just bought my first stop pre-shirt um, <laughs> that was on sale in Woodburn. So like clearly the legend still lives. Um, <laughs> you, you brought up a couple items that I want to uh, I want to follow up on. First, you mentioned Bill Bowerman. Um, you bet. Uh, we haven't talked about uh, Dellinger yet. Can you talk about who those two individuals were and why they matter to Pre's story? Well, Bill Bowerman was the head coach at the time Pre was being recruited. All of the recruitment was done by his assistant coach, Bill Dellinger. Mm -hmm. And you know, of course, Bill Dellinger is a is a uh, sort of a legend in his own right. He won the bronze medal in the five thousand meters in the Olympics. He uh, used to hold American records, and he was he was the guy that went down and watched every race Pre ran in Coos Bay or in Corvallis or wherever. Um, Barman was kind of the guru on the hill and he wrote, did write pre a letter. Um, and I had a copy of it. I don't know what, what oh, I or not. had a copy that where he said, if you come to Oregon, you will be the greatest runner in American history. Something like <laughs> that. And that's that according to Steve was what put him over the top. Because he was, he was being recruited by like every college in the country to come run, but he had the sense that that Bowerman didn't really want him until that letter or something like that. Is that about right? Uh, yeah. It, well, uh, the thing about Bill Bowerman and I didn't know him well, I, I did have some interactions with him, but sometimes he was just contrary. Huh. You know, it, it, he was, um, you know, he, he took pride in saying, I do not recruit. I offer, you know, an education, I offer a good environment, but I, I do not recruit. Well, this letter that says, if you come to Oregon, you'll be, <laughs> to me, that was a recruitment. Sounds letter. like a recruitment tactic. <laughs> well, and, you know, it's like, um, I think it was Bernie Wagner at Oregon State uh, flew in pre in a helicopter to Oregon State, you know, to anything to try to get him to go there. And But I think, plus... Pre and Dellinger really sort of um, were simpatico. So I think that Pre could see himself running under Dellinger and with with uh, Bowerman as the guru. And, you know, Bowerman is a very impressive guy in his own right. Uh, you know, 
uh, 10th Mountain Division in World War II and, and uh, very successful as a coach. And so I think that all of that was an attraction to an 18 year old kid from Coos Bay. Totally. Um, you also mentioned Nike. Uh, so I think your book said that he was the first athlete ever paid to wear Nike shoes. Um, he was also a employee of Nike. Um, what role do you think Nike played in elevating pre, or do you think it was the other way around? Pre was already an established figure and Nike was kind of riding his coattails. Well, I, I think it was a, a back and forth, really, because one of the things that was true is if you look at the 1972 Olympics and you look at the shoes, he's wearing Adidas shoes. Oh, really? That's because in Cree's mind, the Nike spikes were not worthy. They were not good enough yet. Interesting. So that's why, you know, it had nothing to do with being paid money to run. And it was... Adidas is the best shoe. I'm going to run the, with the best shoe. And then I think we figured out this, this was a, a bone of contention, but I think we figured out that in an indoor meet in 1973, he ran in Nikes for the first time. Hmm. And that was a symbol that um, Nike had reached his standard. And, and, you know, Phil Knight in his book mentions about how he was, almost abashed at approaching pre. He didn't go up and say, hey, Steve, put his arm around it. None of that stuff. He said, I kind of slunk away. And huh. I think part of that is that he, you know, this this guy was a force. I mean, the first time I ever saw pre run in, in Hayward Field was 1971 AAU Championships. And I had never been to uh, Eugene at that time. But I was in the uh, East Grandstands, and the meet hadn't started yet. But people started standing up and applauding. And I, I'm going, what, what's going on here? So I stood up and looked around. It was Pre doing his warm-up. <laughs> he was getting a standing ovation. I, I, I'm not in Kansas anymore. You know, it was uh, it was pretty impressive. So he he's one of the most quotable athletes of all time. I mean, he said, he said all kinds of things. And I was trying to think like personality wise, he had like, I don't know if swagger is the right word or arrogance is the right word. Um, but he had this like supreme level of confidence that he projected. Uh, do you think that was, is that who he was there's also like humility that would come out sometimes like when he would lose a race he would be able to like you know he'd make some excuses about why he lost but he'd also give credit to the person who beat him often except for when he didn't and said that they were you know like he doesn't like a kick in track like basically waiting to sprint as hard as you can for the last section of a race so i'm kind of curious what you make of that like personality contradiction of like humility arrogance swagger you know how do you think of who he really was. Uh, I think we I ne we need to keep in mind that he was 24 years old at the time of his death. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, particularly looking back over 50 years, that's really young. So mm -hmm. it's not at all confusing that there would be times when he could be gracious and times where he could be really empathetic. I mean, you know, he went up to the state penitentiary in Salem and started a running club there. That's that's not something that most uh, big men on campus do. You know, right. it was, uh, uh, he wasn't doing it for uh, um, you know, points. He was doing it because he thought that was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, and on the other hand, uh, the one thing Dellinger told me was that there were times when Pre would, you know, mouth off and say, yeah, I'm going to go out and put crap in their legs or whatever. And, and Bill would go, Pre, wh why are you doing that? You're, and putting pressure on himself. And in some senses, I think that he needed that pressure to sort of come up to the standard that he felt was appropriate. Mm. I wish I, I should have written down the quote, but there's something like, uh, if somebody's going to beat me, they're going to have to bleed to do it or something along those lines. Pretty much, yeah. And, 
more, I think a more um, typical comment would have been what he did after the uh, Olympic trials in, in 72, where he said, you know, uh, if I keep training like this, I'm going to be real hard to beat. Yeah, right. Not, I'm going to win the gold medal, but if I keep, you know, if I keep in shape and don't get hurt, I'm going to be real hard to beat. So before we talk about the 72 Olympics, because I think that's an incredibly important milestone in, in Pree's life, um, let's talk about the AAU. So pre, ha- I think hatred is probably the right word for how he felt about the AAU and amateur athletics. I think uh, either you categorized his thinking this way or his quote was, uh, he it, he thought it was autocratic, unresponsive, and out of touch. Um, what was AAU and why did he have such a beef with them? Well, at the time, the Amateur Athletic Union more or less was the national governing body for all Olympic sports. Mm. So you had swimming, you had track and field. Now, the track and field portion was run by a man named Olin Castle, who actually won a medal on the relay team in 1964. Mm. Um, but what pre objected to and in hindsight you just you scratch your head thinking that how could this possibly be but at the time the AAU could tell you where you could and could not run and mm-hmm. they certainly could tell you that you couldn't accept any money for it. Mm-hmm. and so in effect you were chattel you were somebody that they owned and mm-hmm. that pissed pre off mm-hmm. now I think you know, sometimes with the kind of rosy uh, hindsight, we say, well, you know, he was uh, he was a pioneer in, in uh, um, bringing down the AAU. Well, I, I don't I think that's a little grandiose, but I do think he made people think about the unfairness of it. And then after his death, it provided the sort of impetus for people like Frank Shorter and others to challenge what became after the AAU, it became the Athletics Congress, TAC, and then eventually USA Track and Field. And wasn't part of his objection coming from a very personal place of like, he was he was struggling to make ends meet economically, right? He's living in a trailer. Um, you know, he he's trying to figure out how he's, I think there's a story about him like being laid on his gas bill, like he he's not living the life of a glamorous college athlete. Like he's kind of scraping by as the way it comes across. Yeah. And I think that, I think he resented that rightfully. And one of the things that kind of uh, makes him special is that he didn't have any problem saying it publicly. Yeah. And of course the AAU hated that and they, you know, they tried to clamp down on him and he more or less said, screw you. And so I think he he is he's the tip of the spear. He's mm-hmm. the one who started the uh, in effect the Amateur Sports Act of 1978. Yep. He, he's one of the major movers of that. Even though he wasn't political, he didn't go to conventions. He he more or less um, just said it like he thought it was. Yeah, which is probably part of what made him such a special person beyond just the athletic ability um okay so let's talk about 1972 and and the olympics um going into the olympics pre is probably the best known runner in the country if not the world um but i think something that i like was surprising to me and i'm guessing would be surprising to a lot of the listeners is he wasn't necessarily the favorite right, going into this, in part because of his age. So can you set the stage for the 1972 Olympics? And, uh, you know, what was at stake? What was pre-thinking? How were the, how was the track and field community thinking about this? Um, what, what was going on? Well, in the United States, pre was acknowledged by everyone as being the best. Okay. But, you know, we were kind of a little backwater as far as distance running goes, because uh, you know, the world record, I think, at the time was held by a Belgian, Emil Poudelins. You had uh, Lasse Viren, who was a very good um, Finnish athlete and who, by the way, was only a year and a half older than Pri. So hmm. 
when people start talking about how young Pre was, it's not so mat- much a matter of his age as his lack of international experience. Mm. You know, he'd run in in a few races um, in like Colombia, and he ran he ran in a race actually in Hawaii against Jerry Lindgren and others. But in terms of going over and mixing it up with the Europeans, he didn't have that experience. And so, you know, one of the things that is somewhat is sometimes forgotten is that um, when the Israeli athletes were murdered, the uh, decision was made to go on with the games, but to delay everything by one day. Mm. And, you know, according to Bill Dellinger, that really, that really bothered Pre. I mean, obviously the the deaths uh, when you're 20, 23 years old, you don't think in terms of your your compatriots dying. Mm-hmm. And there was this bloody um, massacre, uh, and it meant that his sort of uh, internal clock was thrown off. It was no longer going to be on the day he thought it was going to be Mm -hmm. um but you know bill took him out went to the bavarian alps and kind of calmed him down and and gave him a pep talk and and uh you know the race itself i was there i i you know oh really wow I, I, i can picture it vividly and and uh what i remember uh very much so from where i was sitting was that uh, Mohammed Gamudi, who was a Tunisian runner, cut off Pre not once but twice. Right. Pre was he was not a, a particularly fast finisher in the sense of having great speed, but he would kind of build his his speed. He, he would start, you know, he put his head down and 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 start pumping harder and to have that have that jerk, you know, mm-hmm. if somebody cut you off and having to start all over again and wind up to a sprint. And, uh, you know, he gave it everything he had and uh, ended up fourth. And uh, uh, Viren was first and Gamuti second. And Ian Stewart was third. Ian Stewart, um, a great Briton, he, he and I became pretty good friends in the, hmm. in the last 30, 40 years. And he always said, you know, um, three went for it. He was going for the medal. I ran, well, he felt he ran like crap um, because he wasn't ever in the race. You know, right. he he ended up passing pre to get the bronze medal, but he never challenged for the gold. And I think that's sort of his tip of the cap to Prefontaine is he went for it. He didn't yep. get it, but he went for it. So as people can probably imagine, Pre incredibly competitive person takes wins and losses very personally. Um, how how did his fourth place finish in the Olympic Games impact him on a like sort of emotional and mental health level? Well, I I can't speak you know personally because I, I wasn't around him at that time. His roommate at the time and good friend Pat Tyson, who's now the head coach of Gonzaga, um, you know. And he was he was upset. He was depressed, if you will. And uh, it took him a while to sort of swing back around. And I think, you know, the sport was loosening up a little bit. So, you know, he he would get paid under the table, as most of the top runners did. And, you know, he had lots of support here in Eugene for people, you know, come on, Pre, you're going to you're going to do it next time. And so on and so forth. So I think after maybe six or eight months of depression, he was getting back into the mindset of, uh, well, there is a next time. And Mm -hmm. keep in mind at that time, there were no world championships. There was only the Olympic games every four years, which made it all the more important in everyone's mind. And of course, everyone reminded him Hey, you you'll get them next time. You'll get them in Montreal in 76. And it's a little hard to you know keep your head down when people are always saying that. So 
disappointing fourth place finish, but as you as you alluded to, st- still regarded and perceived as uh, a incredible world class athlete who may very well uh, at least challenge for gold, if not win gold at the next Olympics. But he's got this sort of internal tension where he's navigating all this. H- how how far after the Olympic Games are finished is does he die? Well, the Olympics were over in October of 72, and he died um, at the very last day of May in 75. Okay. So you're talking about 73, 74, uh, two and three quarter years. Not almost. quite three years. So pre is... Uh, what, what what is going on on that? There's some race at Hayward Field that the the day that he dies. What was what was the occasion? Uh, <clears throat> Bowerman was trying to raise money to rebuild the West Grandstands, uh. which were totally uh, dilapidated, and so he had what he called the uh, restoration meet, and the restoration meet was something where he highlight pre. I mean, pre was the draw and, you know, bring in a few people uh, for him to run against, have some other events and so on. So there was that in uh, 1974 and then again in 1975. And they they were going to uh, end the restoration meet after the 75 meet. And um, the Oregon Track Club, which was putting on the, the, the races, was going to rename it the Bowerman Classic. Mm. And... Uh, so uh, Free ran the race and, you know, the story is pretty well outlined in the book of uh, he went to a party at Jeff Hollister's house and uh, he then drove his then girlfriend, Nancy Allman, to her car, then took Kenny Moore, or excuse me, Frank Shorter, up to Kenny Moore's house where Frank was staying. And they talked for a while and agreed to go on a run the next day. And Frank got out and, you know, he later said he never thought that Pre was drunk or was uh, at all uh, Im- impacted. Um, and then Pre went down the hill. And that was that. So uh, one, like, quirky, weird thing that, is it true that the only time Pre ever wore a black singlet was the his last race? No, it's not. Okay. Okay. I can. <laughs> uh, he got it in Italy. It says Nord Italia on it, and Northern Italy. And uh, the poster we put out, I think, in 2017, is him running in that, and it was from a race in Italy. So he wore it in Italy. I don't think he ever wore it in another race in Eugene except that last one. And, you know, there are a lot of things that, I don't know if you have seen the famous Brian, La- I'm looking at it now, famous Brian Lanker photo, and it's a close-up of Pre, and he's got this far away look in his eyes. Um, let's see, it's a back cover of this book. I was gonna say, oh yeah, 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 you've got it, you've got it on the inside page um, of the updated one. Oh, that, yeah, that was Rodale doing that, so. yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, the um, this is probably the last photo taken of him mm. at the meet from a mm. as a professional photographer. I mean, I'm sure someone from the stands, but uh, you know, and it's such an eerie photo. It's uh, yeah, absolutely uh, amazing. Well, there's so there's all these, and I think when someone of his who's as icon- iconic as him dies, they are much more likely to be the subject of sort of conspiracy or, you know, like there's this big urban legend about the only time you ever wore a black singlet is, was this race. I thought that was true until you just corrected it. Um, There's also like, it seems there, there's some debate about what actually happened um, in his death. Um, (laughs) So, so, so he, it's it's skyline boulevard right in in um eugene where he's driving 
there's theories about well it's theory number one and the i think the official story is like drunk he, he was a drunk driver but as you make clear in the book like he he definitely was drinking that evening but um most of the people who spent time with him didn't think that he was drunk or overly drunk or or they do a, a toxicology or a blood test but uh it's like done by the mortician and not the medical examiner or something what is that controversy about uh, it's never been done as far as I know, for, as far as I can tell, they have never taken a blood sample by a mortician. It's always supposed to be the medical examiner. Why did that happen? Do we know? That's part of the conspiracy theories. There are those who believe that, I, I'm not one of them, but they believe that the uh, uh, certain people in the police department did not want him um, to have an excuse for dying. Uh -huh. um, and my own feeling is that, and I always say this because it sounds like I'm being an apologist for uh, drinking and driving. I don't believe that alcohol was a factor in his death that night. That's not to say there weren't many other times when it could have been. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he liked to drink, he liked to have beer. And then he can get into a car and don't forget, this is 1975. It's not uh, 2025. And uh, my own theory on it is that there was another car involved mm -hmm. and that as he was probably was driving fast. If you ever come to Eugene and go up to the Prees Rock, you'll see there's a very sharp turn. And if someone's in your lane, there's nowhere to go except up on the rock wall. Mm. So I think that that was the. Uh, well, and the, we know we know there was another car. We don't know when the the person driving that car alleges that they saw the crash and panicked and then drove home to get their dad, who was a doctor, and then came back. The alternative theory is no, pre swerved. They never, they, no, they never came back. Oh, they didn't come back. They did not come back. See, that's the deal. Is you go home because you're panicked and your dad's a doctor. Why doesn't he call the police? Huh. Why didn't he call the ambulance? They never came back. Well, who person who came back was a uh, neighbor, Alvarado. Yeah, and he he heard the crash, and he came out just as the other car was going up the past his house. So he got in his car to follow him, and actually went and, and saw where the the uh, other MG was parked. And then he came back down Skyline B Boulevard and came upon Pre. He didn't know the Pre was lying underneath the car. Right. He had heard the crash and thought that, you know, that some kid would, had, had uh, caused some kind of accident. And uh, so, it, you know, there's so many questions about that. It's, You know, I, I'm I'm hoping for a deathbed confession, right? About what really really happened that night. Um, so to make a long and unclear story short, pre pre dies that evening. Um, by the time the police are on the scene, he's declared dead. He is alive when Alvarado gets to the car. Alvarado like uses all the energy he can to lift the car. Pre is clear that he's still breathing at that time, but he can't, he doesn't have enough force to move the car. He leaves by the time the police beat him back uh, and Pre is declared dead. The next day, uh, the word is starting to spread. What, how big of news was it when Pre died? How big of a story was this? Well, I, I wasn't living in Eugene at the time. I know it was, it was huge. As far as I was concerned, I get a call. I was living in Palo Alto and uh, get a call from my editor at Track and Field News, and he opens with uh, Pre's dead. Uh -huh. And um, that was, you know, I knew it wasn't a joke. And uh, he didn't have any real uh, backstory on it, just he was in an accident and he died. So uh, I know that I was. I don't know, shocked. That's that's too mild a word. I mean, I, I didn't go into work that day. I, wow. you know, I just was almost catatonic because 
I was a pre-fan and, you know, somebody who's so full of life and you're told that he's gone and you realize, you know, this is, there's no do over, you know, it's not like, okay, tomorrow we'll wake up and we'll all be a, a distant dream. It's just, it's very sad. So for my my political audience, I, I love the inclusion of the of Tom McCall's remarks, Governor Tom McCall at the time, um, who I think kind of paints a picture of how big of a deal this was for, you know, the sitting governor at the time to uh, he wrote a uh, wrote a letter to Prefontaine's parents. And it said, here's a quote from Tom McCall, Oregon has never been struck such a tragic blow. Pre was an essential part of the pride we all feel in Oregon. He was a magnificent performer and a human being of admirable, admirable in- independence. No one so young has ever made such an important or such an imprint on our state, the nation, and the world, at least no one from this part of the country, nor will we see his like again in my lifetime. These are just words, and I could go on wringing my hands, but they are words that struggle to say to you how we all feel in this moment of deprivation. Um so you can tell it's almost like those are the kind of words you use when when like a head of state dies. Um, it was I was talking to to Reagan Canope, who's my co-host on this podcast. And uh, before I, I started the interview, and I was like, it's kind of like when, you know, when Robert Kennedy was killed or when James Dean was killed, like there's these people who die early in life and they're mourned because of who they were for sure and what they accomplished, but also because there is this promise about who they might've been or what they might've been able to do that is taken from all of us. And it feels like that's part of what elevates um, someone who's a great athlete and an interesting person into this status of legend or icon or, or whatever. I'm kind of curious how you think about that. Well, I, I think that's spot on. I mean, uh, you know, part of the um, pre iconica what is it? Iconography. Thank you. Iconography is the fact that he died young. I mean, mm-hmm. how would he have done in Montreal? What would he have done? Would he have become a big, a big wheel at Nike? What would he, you know? It, it's just all the what ifs. And uh, uh, you mentioned Robert Kennedy. Um, I'm old enough to remember when John F. Kennedy was killed, and there you had this, the whole sense of this future just cut off and uh so it, it's certainly something that has fed into the pre-legend mm-hmm. because we will never know yeah so in terms of my, my final questions are about pre's legacy and what he means to the state of oregon what he means to the running community um for you, you personally, what do you, how do you think of Pree's legacy and what what he meant to to all of us? Well, I I always felt it was sort of a standard that um, you know, people would say when I was the meet director for the Prefontaine Classic, what what are your what are your plans for this year's Pree? And I would say my goal is to have a meet worthy of the name, hmm. and that was pretty much my standard mantra over the years. And um, I also got quite famous for saying, we will have the best fields we've ever had at this year's Prefontaine class. <laughs> I, I couldn't guarantee it was going to be the best meet, but I could guarantee we were going to have the best athletes there. And, you know, one of the things that he always aspired to was to have foreign athletes come over here mm-hmm. so that he could drub them at Hayward Field <laughs> front of the adoring fans so that was kind of my approach to it yeah and and to the state of oregon um or to the university of oregon or to coos bay um where do you how do you see pre's uh role or position in the communities that he was a part of when uh when he was alive well the unfortunate thing is that those of us who were his peers are dying off yeah you know it's been almost 50 years since he died yeah more than 50 years since he came onto the international stage so i think that um it's not so much about the person as the legend Hmm. 
and I think that the legend is firmly established and that, um, you know, the people that are doing the Prefontaine Classic now, I, they, they're doing things I never, never thought to do. I went to a watch party today to watch the, the uh, Lausanne Diamond League and they had, uh, they had little, uh, what do you call those little balls that you, uh, uh, tension balls. Oh yeah. Stress balls. Stress balls. You know, they had had in the shape of the diamond for the Diamond League and then with Prefontaine Classic on it and giving them away free for people to, to play with. And I never thought to do anything like that. And, of course, posters and, and so on. I They are – this year's Prefontaine Classic is going to be the Diamond League Finals. That's where all of the best athletes come for a two-day meet in September. And – that will be the biggest and best Prefontaine Classic ever. Wow! And so yeah, it's a it's a special year, and uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, Tom, for all that you've done to to keep Pre's story and legacy alive, thank you, and thank you for coming on the podcast to talk to um, my audience about who he was. And obviously, uh, the book is going to be around for forever um you've sort of permanently codified pre's story in a way that i think is really special he's he is an oregon original um and a huge part of the state's sort of reputation and legacy in the athletics world and especially for the university of oregon um so i just want to say thank you and and uh, tell you how much we appreciate all you've done well you're very welcome awesome uh tom thanks again for coming on the podcast and uh listeners thanks for listening we'll see you back here next week